Welcome to Your Brand Amplified, the podcast where we interview marketers, publicists, and brands to learn their stories, what makes them tick, and tips and tricks that make a difference. Super excited to have Chris Weir here today. Chris, you have over 20 years experience in video production. And there are so many questions about video production and what goes into it that I think people today probably don't realize. They think of creating reels or TikTok videos and that that's enough to move their business forward. So I'm excited to have this conversation and really do a deep dive into the industry. Is this where you started or did you do something else before getting into video production? That's really cool that you asked that because nobody's asked me that before. So yeah, I actually went to school for theater. And so I learned all about dramatic structure and directing and working with actors and all these things before I went into video production. And the first thing I did after I was in theater school was I made a feature length film, which they tell you never to do. (laughs) And I was like, well, my idea is too big. I've got to play a feature length film. And at the time I was working at my dad's butcher shop. And so I was like, got this great. So I need to write a movie around being in a butcher shop and working in a butcher shop. So I did that. And that was my film school. Nice. And then from there, I started, you know, working for little production companies in Chicago and did that for a while. And then at a certain point, I decided like, I'm ready to go out on my own. So yeah, that's kind of my trajectory. Nice. Let's talk about what kinds of video production you do. Sure. So with Cleaver Creative, which is my video production company, we do a lot of different kinds of videos. Obviously, we have done a ton of animated videos. And those work really well for commercials, explainer videos, if you're trying to explain an app, how it works, sales presentations, those types of things. But about three years ago, I started creating videos on LinkedIn. And immediately, it was apparent that there was this gap of good quality video on LinkedIn. People were very comfortable writing articles there, talking about themselves and about their businesses. But nobody really was taking that leap to say, I'm going to put my face out and I'm going to talk about my business. And so just from doing that, even from the very first couple of videos that I threw out there, I was like, oh, wow, people are really responding to this because there's this lack of good quality video there. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, I think there still is. To some extent, I think think there's a lack of good quality business content on LinkedIn. There is good quality business content, but there's a ton of stuff to sift through now to get to that stuff that is very unique to your industry. And so because of my history working with B2B, videos, I was able to kind of speak the language, I think, of business people to say, here's how you get your message across in a way that actually people will want to watch and listen to it. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting because I recently interviewed somebody who used to do SEO, but now does video only SEO. That's a whole yeah, this is a whole sub industry. Wow. YouTube is a search engine and as much as it is a social network, as much as it is an entertainment platform. <laughs> yeah, it's a very unique space to create content. And we see everybody, all the social media channels are trying to compete with each other by moving to short form video. We see podcasts. I mean, my podcast is on YouTube as a video podcast, Mm -hmm. but you can also do that on Spotify and so many platforms. So video really is the way to go. But I feel like there's so much to sift through with creating good quality video, hiring the right people, knowing who to work with and how... Are they going to be intentional about it? Right? Because you were talking about explainer videos and animations. And I know people will say, oh, just go to Upwork or Fiverr and find somebody who can do blah, blah, blah. So talk about that a little bit, because I feel like that's probably a pain point for you and something that you have to maybe talk to people about why you're different and what you put into the process and the the product that might be different than what they'll find somewhere else. For sure. Yeah. I think it is a really unique time to be making content because I've seen the industry evolve from really people thinking they needed a TV commercial right, (laughs) to then thinking they needed a website to then thinking I need a video for my website, Mm -hmm. which is a lot of people are still kind of in. Now people's mindsets is mostly like, I need a video for social media. And the truth is you need a video strategy Mm -hmm. for social media. And that can range quite widely. So depending on the person or the business's area, I'll recommend a different strategy. 
If the business is really focused more on teaching, then probably YouTube is the best strategy. But a lot of the businesses that we work with are on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, LinkedIn really is networking at scale when you're using video because Ah. you're talking to your network of a few hundred or a few thousand people and you will get that organic reach on LinkedIn that you don't get on Facebook. And so if you literally show up and talk in an intelligent and entertaining way, people will watch because there is this hunger, there's this thirst for good quality business content. But you kind of have to know what message to roll out when and how to say it in a way that engages with your network and gets them wanting to kind of continue the conversation with you. Can people just make a TikTok video for LinkedIn? Can people just like make their own video and do their own thing? To some extent, yes. We as consumers of content want to see the content come to some extent from that business's creative power. Mm-hmm. I think the days of going into a company and shooting all day long and getting all these interviews and putting it into a three or four minute video that is this really high polished thing are kind of gone. That feels antiquated and it doesn't feel authentic. And people's attention spans are so short, they can't watch that until you have built up more trust. Mm. And so what typically I recommend doing is having people initially self-record, we'll get on Zoom or something like this, Mm -hmm. we'll figure out their first four concepts and I'll coach them through it and say, well, maybe start off with this. This is a better attention getter. Say something like this. Even if you mess up, keep going. Mistakes are fine, blah, 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 blah. And then as we go, you need to increase quality and you need to increase value as you go. So you kind of start off and don't overproduce it because you want your content to be the star. And then as you keep making more content, people keep wanting more from you. So it means you can actually deliver more value. And it means that if you have their attention for four to six weeks, Hmm. then you can make something that is a little bit bigger and asks a bit more of them. For instance, one of my clients now has just created their own app and it is for a process improvement. And so it has a number of different features inside of it where it allows you to do a 5Y walkthrough. It allows you to do, you know, crafting a quality problem statement for, you know, Six Sigma process improvement, (laughs) doing waste walks for manufacturing. And so now we've taken that initial work that we did creating a vlog and said, okay, let's take this skill and teach it to your employees. (laughs) So now we can get your employees talking about the app. And then let's actually also get testimonials from your customers and let's fold that then into a ad strategy. Yeah. So I think for a lot of, especially smaller businesses, it's just a hurdle to get started. Mm -hmm. And then as you get started, you can build and build and grow your strategy. Yeah. Public speaking is something people fear more than death or somewhere right there. Yes. So obviously not you, not me. (laughs) But how do you get over those objections and those hurdles when somebody's like, I know I need a content strategy, I know I need to do video, but I'm scared to start? Right. It's a skill as well as a talent. So some people are just natural public speakers. Mm -hmm. And from early on, they could get up in front of a class and deliver a speech and not get butterflies and not screw up what they're going to say. And for the rest of us, it's something we have to learn. And and you can learn it as a skill and you can build that skill and you can exercise that muscle. And I usually tell folks that if public speaking was the secret to success 30 years ago, speaking on video is the secret to success now. Nice. Because it allows you to take your presence and scale it and Mm -hmm. say, I'm going to send this video out to all of our clients or to all of my employees. And if you're not comfortable talking on on video, (laughs) you want to be because everybody who is honestly 36 years and younger Mm -hmm. has kind of grown up like almost wanting to be a YouTube star. (laughs) They've been vlogging since they were like 15. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Something to think about. Right. 
Yeah, gosh. Well, so you're seeing that a lot of people are using video as a content strategy for LinkedIn. I think that's brilliant. I also love that you've talked about how you can repurpose the content and then you can start using it for your ad campaigns. I always talk about integrated marketing and how you can take one piece of content and put it on your website, in your newsletter, on your social media channels, in your ads. So you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> Yeah, trust me, it, it took me forever. It took me probably 15 years of being in video production to get in front of the camera and go, I'm going to talk about what okay. I think is important. So I understand 100% the fear <laughs> that people have about like, I've got to work to all these, solve all these problems, do all this work. I don't want to get in front of a camera now. It's work. It takes effort, but the dividends pay off. Mm -hmm. So I really recommend just like doing it and you don't have to post what you record. You can start, you can try it and say, if you like it, post it. And if you don't, don't try it again next week. But I really do think it's like the hardest part is getting started. And I know that like firsthand. So when you work with somebody, like you said, you talk about their business goals, their audience, all of those different questions that go into brand building. How much content do you start with? Do you recommend that they have a content library? You know, they have a whole bunch of things ready to go. So that way, if something else happens in their life or their business, they don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, I didn't get this shot in time for the next part of the story. Right. So yes, I mean, what we do with clients when we first start working with them is sit down for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And we have this long interview questions, we never get through all of them. But we talk about all kinds of stuff. We talk about everything they're passionate about in their business, mm -hmm. what they want to accomplish with this, what their goals are. And then we also talk in about who they are personally, because a lot of that stuff can get put aside in the business world. And when you're talking to a broad audience about something that's very niche. Mm. You know, I have one client that I work with who does like computer arts, basically. <laughs> the best okay. way I can describe it. I don't even know. <laughs> For manufacturing. So it's very specific. Yeah. It's like <laughs> very, different very little specific. motherboards and stuff like that. And honestly, I don't even need to know what he's selling because we don't really talk about that part that much. Okay. We talk about his golf and things like that because he posts photos of the gear that they sell. Mm -hmm. He writes articles about that stuff, but then they also know him as the golf guy and he also is into weightlifting. Mm -hmm. And so once you start to correlate those things together and you say, I really trust this person. I really like this person, I like their personality. Yes, yeah, sometimes he's talking about computer chips for manufacturing, mm -hmm. which I don't know any about, but I do know Brian, when you are talking to your manufacturing friend who's like, I've got this problem, I'm like, well, I know Brian sells computer parts for manufacturing. I saw him talk about that thing you were just talking about. Let oh, me introduce you. Yeah. And so there's these affinity topics that you also want to weave into your content so that if your content is very niche, people can connect with you if they're into the other things that you're passionate about. And if you're not passionate about it, don't talk about it. But mm -hmm. there's always things that we're passionate about that, that appeal to a broader audience. Yeah, I think it's also a really great way to show your brand values because yes. what I'm seeing is a lot of companies after the pandemic and all of the different things that have been happening for a long time, but that were now that we had to actually see happen in front of us. You know, a lot of companies went out and made statements about this or that, but a lot of them, when you work for the company, you don't see those values in action. And you might see something on a website, but then you find out that they're actually doing something else that isn't their values in action. So I think that's a really great way also to use video because you can't hide. No, you can't. And I really do believe that this whole content creation piece is going to give certain companies this leg up hmm. in the fact that you're going to be able to see into the inner workings of the company in a different way than you have in the past. Yeah. Because if somebody is loyal to your company to the point that they're willing to talk about it as part of their job, even if that's not like a main part of their job. Like, like I have one connection to my LinkedIn network who is an event planner who mm -hmm. recently took a job with REI. And she is just always talking about how much she respects REI, their plans to work towards saving the planet, mm -hmm. and the fact that the company is structured as a co-op, oh, yeah. things that I had no idea about. And she's just talking about it because she really appreciates the company and they do what they say they're going to do. Yeah. 
And I think if you are building a company the right way with the right culture, it's hard to ask your employees to say like, hey, will you come out and make videos for (laughs) us? That's a big ask. But if they are willing to do it on their own, or if they are incentivized or encouraged to say, hey, you know, do you mind once a month talking about something that you enjoyed at our company? People will be more willing to do it if the company, like, as you say, like reflects their actual values. Now, what about cost? Because I'm imagining that you're able to work with people anywhere in the world now with this virtual existence that we have. (laughs) Right. You talked about some of the things that have changed in the industry over the 20 years. But I'd love to hear about that part of it. And then has that helped with costs? What does it look like when somebody hires a professional instead of going, oh, I'm just going to shoot something on my phone or you know whatever else they want to do? Right. Yeah, I think our videos definitely do look different than other videos that I've seen out there. And the gear and the cost of recording it is pretty cheap, honestly, because everyone has these amazing cameras in their pockets. I mean, these cameras, I would have killed for this camera 20 (laughs) years ago when I started. It's such a beautiful image that you can get from your phone. And the audio quality can be very good. So there is just some best practices that once you learn those, you can get an amazing quality video. And then once you learn the strategy around like, what do people actually want to see? How do I capture that? You can self-record a lot. Hmm. And so what I tell folks is like, yes, you can get started out on your own. You can learn all this stuff, but it's probably going to take you six months mm. or a year to learn the things that you would learn if you if you work with us for three months and give it a try. And then like most of the people that I have worked with, they kind of get the itch and they get the response from their network that they want to keep creating more content because it gets reinforced. And so I recommend, obviously, (laughs) investing (laughs) in some professional advice at the start, even if it might be a little bit more than you expect, because you're going to learn the skill, you're going to learn how to do it properly. And Mm -hmm. then I'm like, if you don't want to work with us, you know, after three months, fire Mm -hmm. us and keep making videos. And I will still support you. I will still go on and I'll like those videos and I'll comment on them. Because mostly what I realized last year is like my main North Star is just helping great people do Mm -hmm. great things. I just want to help great things get created in the world. And what I found is that like, when you're creating content like this, you attract like-minded people. And the clients that I work with now, I just really connect with. And so for me, it's not really about like, oh, I want to keep a client for like five years. I'm like, start with me, start with us for three months. And if you want to do it on your own after that, please, by all means, do it and learn everything you need to learn and then just go off and do it. But a lot of people just stay because they're like, oh, it's actually actually yeah. like the system. Because yeah. we record <laughs> once a month and then you have your content for the whole month. Oh, that's amazing. Which yeah. is nice for people. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, it's just like I work in marketing and PR and branding, but I don't have time to post on social media and to all these other things. If I didn't have a team of people who were really experts at what they do, right? You know, doing that stuff, I wouldn't have the time to focus on what I am best at. Right. You need some kind of a team. And I do think that is something that I'm also seeing, especially in the small business world, Mm -hmm. is that now it's more about businesses collaborating together Mm -hmm. and creating a common goal and then working towards that little teams of three and five and what have you, as opposed to big, big companies that go out and make, you know, Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more bubbling of small companies helping each other. And I'm seeing way more like fractional. COOs, fractional Mm -hmm. CMOs that are working and consistently working with three or four companies at a time and building these networks, which is, it's a pretty cool time to be in business, I think. Yeah. So what else do you see happening in the world of video? I feel like it's been around, but it's changing quickly. And I know there's also the whole AI discussion, which we haven't touched on. Yeah. Doing with that or what people think is going to happen with video and AI. My guess is that's going to be the next biggest shift in video. And it's going to be interesting to see how that happens. I would say the one advantage that you have in creating video is that we are, as humans, highly attuned to facial recognition. And there's a specific part of our brain that is specifically devoted to micro changes in our facial features, like a little twinkle in the eye or like a raised eyebrow. We are highly Mm -hmm. focused on these things. 
which AI is going to have a hard time replacing. Even the best AI avatar is not going to be able to convey these little tiny micro expressions that are very natural to us that we are really highly attuned to look for to see if someone's being authentic, if they're telling the truth, if they're being funny, all these things. That said, I think it'll probably come more in how video is served to us. And so if you have good video content, you're going to be able to, like you say, take 10 past vlog posts that you made or 10 past excerpts from your podcast, put a tiny ad spend behind them, have AI create 10 different landing pages and say, make an algorithm to serve all of these to these niche audiences and tell me which three perform the best. Those are the three we're going to go with for our campaign. So I think it's going to be able to become easier to get targeted messages to the right people. But I do think that creating organic video is going to be very hard to replace. And if you get good at it, it's going to be a skill that you can just use in a multitude of ways. Awesome. Well, what kind of businesses do you usually work with? Do you work with solo entrepreneurs and people starting out, corporations, kind of a mix? The size of the business that we work with for the vlogs is usually companies that have a handful of employees, Mm -hmm. you know, minimum three to five, I would say. I do want to put together something for solopreneurs because I do think in a lot of ways, this is a skill that solopreneurs can benefit from greatly. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's going to be a cohort or a mastermind or something like that. Mm -hmm. So if there's people in your network that are like, oh my gosh, I would love this, but budget is not right there for a marketing thing. If you share my LinkedIn handle or whatever, happy to connect with people and say, yeah, I'd love to be a part of a cohort. It's not something that I've really worked towards yet, but I would love to be able to offer that at some point. But usually it's, yeah, smaller businesses that know they need this. They probably don't have a very formalized sales and marketing plan. They probably don't have a dedicated salesperson. Oftentimes it's the company owner who's the salesperson as well. And they need to organically generate more interest in them because usually they are the company. They are the biggest asset of the company. Yeah. Amazing. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us, tips and tricks that people should think about when they're thinking about their video strategy? Well, I don't know. I was actually just interested in your experience using video. Like, How much have you been using video? Did you start off with an audio podcast and then switch to video? And have you noticed a difference in your engagement or a difference in the results? Well... That's a really good question. I've always recorded the video and the audio. I just started putting them onto YouTube recently. Mm -hmm. Again, this is all me funding everything. So I have to say, okay, let me baby step. I have the content, but I haven't pushed it out yet. Yeah. So now we're starting to look at, let's not just do one videogram for social media. Let's create three or four or five snippets from each one, as well as the static Mm -hmm. graphic and quotes. And I use AI for my captions and show notes and transcripts and things like that. But yeah, I haven't fully gone into the video world, although I know it's something I need to do. So it's something that I'm slowly making my way into. I think we have 20 to 40 episodes of the podcast on YouTube now, but I haven't uploaded like the video to Spotify because I know Spotify does video podcasts. I haven't really used it as part of my LinkedIn strategy to your point. Right. So there are a lot of things right. that, that I can still do. It's just all about time and money. <laughs> what are you going so... to allocate towards when? I totally understand that. And in many ways, I feel like it's better to focus on YouTube for a while, to focus mm-hmm on one platform to maximize it, which we probably already are. But I do think as entrepreneurs, as business owners, people feel this stress Mm -hmm. to hear something and go, oh, I got to be on TikTok now. I don't know. I don't know how to dance. (laughs) I don't want to be on TikTok either. I think especially for smaller businesses like us, it is better to pick something, stay in the lane, get the best results you can get out of it, and then add something on once you want to. But like the fact that you have all that content, yeah, you're you're primed to leverage it, which is great because a lot of that stuff I'm sure is pretty evergreen where Mm -hmm. you can put it out anytime you want to. I mean, I'm hammering people with content I made three years ago, but a lot of people who are watching it didn't see it three years ago. And it's an amazing asset once you start to build that library. Well, I know who to talk to. So (laughs) (laughs) maybe you can be my first cohort member. (laughs) Yay! Yeah. Well, and I do have a program called the Brand Amplifier. It's basically for entrepreneurs because I was having so many people come to me who said they wanted PR. And I was like, you're not ready for PR. Your audience personas, your messaging, your values. Have you worked through all that stuff? You have a logo, but 
at a website, but does it really speak to the right audience? You know, so I had to go back. So the brand amplifier is just has just launched, but we'll be having guest speakers come in to talk to cool. our cohorts. So I'll have to bring you in as a guest speaker for that too. Oh, I would love that. That yes. would be amazing. Yeah. That would be great. Awesome. And Chris, what is the best place for people to reach you? Your LinkedIn, your website, socials? LinkedIn is usually the best place to get a hold of me. I always check my LinkedIn messages there. So people want to connect with me. I pretty much connect with anyone if they send a personal message. Nice. My last name is Weir, W-E-I-H-E-R, Chris Weir mm-hmm. on LinkedIn. Should be pretty easy to find. Hopefully I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> and if they want to connect on our website, it's cleavercreates.com, C-L-E-A-V-E-R, creates.com. Cool. And lastly, do you have a favorite quote or mantra? My recent favorite quote is, you don't rise to the level of your goals. You fail to the level of your processes. Oh, okay. Yeah. In the past couple of years, I have become reluctantly aware that I'm a total process nerd. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I like we started using Monday and I love having processes set in place. My problem is, is that in the past, I never liked following other people's processes. <laughs> I'm kind of an entrepreneurial person. Mm-hmm. Like, I, don't tell me how to do it. But I love to create processes and I love to collaborate with my team on it and figure out what's the best way. Are we improving it over time? So I find a lot of value in that. Yeah. I love processes. I am more of that person who's like just going to throw everything out. And I have great people who take it and, and make it into a process for us, but it really helps streamline efficiency and actually gives me more room to be creative and think about how am I going to pitch this client for XYZ or what am I going to talk about when I do this talk versus that talk? So, right. Yeah. It's a game changer. And it's taken me a while to figure out that that's what great businesses do is they build really good processes. And so I've been nerding out on that a lot lately. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been a really wonderful conversation. I think hopefully a lot of people will hear this and realize that you too should start using video content, particularly on LinkedIn, and to get your business pushed forward. Chris, I really appreciate you. And to the audience, thank you for coming back and listening to another episode of Your Brand Amplified. Thanks so much for having me. This was a blast. Want more? Check out amplifywithannika.com or follow me on socials at amplifywithannika.com.